Good morning. We're so glad you've joined us. Will you stand to your feet as we worship Jesus together this morning?
to Abraham. Since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by something greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf. As we continue to sing together, we're singing, you say I'm loved, you say I'm yours. You say I'm saved, you say your grace is enough, and we can believe that because God himself in his true character cannot lie. He has to tell the truth, and we see in Hebrews chapter 11, those who went before us in faith of God's promises, and they saw those promises fulfilled. He is who he says he is, he is trustworthy. And we can sing this and declare this and remind ourselves and each other of who he is. Side. 
to Community Bible Church. It is wonderful to see you all. So glad that you have joined us for Worship Gathered. I want to take a moment and welcome any of our guests that are here with us this morning. If today is your first day at Community Bible, we are grateful to have you here with us. We would love to invite you to stop by our Welcome Center out in the lobby. We'd love to meet you and connect more. And we also have a small gift for you to say thank you for spending part of your weekend with us. So hope that you will stop by before you head out this morning morning. Well, there's two things that I want to mention to you all this morning. The first is that we are happy to announce that we have multiple community groups that are open or new this fall. Our community groups are designed to help you connect with other believers. They provide a community to care for you and your family, and they also help you and others um, 
learn more about Jesus and what it means to follow him. And so if you are interested in joining a community group, you can scan the QR code right in front of you. You can and the code behind me, a jump on the church app. But if you look under groups, you can get more information about each of our community groups that are gonna be meeting this fall. You can get information about when and where they meet, how often they meet, do they eat dinner, do they have dessert when they gather? And you can also uh, get more information about what they're gonna be studying this fall. So you can contact the group leader um, directly through the website. Um, you can ask questions. Um, yeah, they can share more information with you, and you can let them know if you're interested in joining their group. So I hope that you will check that out today or this week and find a place where you can connect more this fall. Well, next up, we are excited to announce our upcoming missions conference. When you came in this morning, you found a card on the seat uh, next to you. That is your save the date. I hope that you will take it. It's yours to keep. You can stick it on your fridge, put it in your Bible. It's to serve as a reminder about this awesome opportunity that we have, have coming up in just a few months. Um, the theme for our missions conference this year is testify the last frontier. Matthew 24, 14 tells us that the gospel will be preached in all the nations, and then the end will come. As followers of Jesus, we get to be a part of ushering in Christ's return. And with 42% of the world's population still unreached with the good news of Jesus, we have an awesome opportunity before us to help spread the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth. So I hope that you and your family will mark your calendars and plan to join us for that really encouraging weekend. We've got multiple speakers lined up. We've got missionaries coming in town, and we're going to get to hear about their life and ministry overseas. Um, we're going to have yummy food. We've got kids programming uh, every time that we meet and gather that weekend. So I hope that you will uh, join us for that awesome weekend. You can scan the QR code on uh, your save the date or the one behind me Green, and you can get more information about our guest speakers, what missionaries are going to be in town, and go ahead and register and let us know that you plan to be there. Well, Pastor Aaron is away today, and this week he's with Josh Murphy and Mike Wagner down in Costa Rica. They are teaching and equipping local pastors and leaders with our global ministry partner, Bible Institutes of Central America. So I want to encourage you to keep them in your prayers as well as our Azerbaijan team as they are ministering in the nations. Um, but this morning... Have the one and only David Lehman here to share a message. And so I want to invite you, yes, uh, to turn your Bibles to Galatians 2 as my awesome husband comes up to share God's word with us. Good morning. I am the one and only, but I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I am a one and only. Um, it's good to be with you guys today, um, sharing the word with you. It's uh, going to be a good morning. It's Baptism Sunday. That's good, right? <laughs> Celebration of new life. I remember when me and my wife first moved to North Carolina 12 years ago, um, we were looking for churches to come to, and we um, came by this church one Sunday. The pastor wasn't preaching. They weren't having any message. It was Baptism Sunday, and we were so blown away. Um, we didn't care who the pastor was. We didn't care about any, anything. We were so blown away that this church was about mission. This church was about seeing lives transformed, and this church was living and active about mission in their community, and that's why we ultimately joined this church. Um, because what the young people like to say is they were about that life. Come on, college students. You got a lot of college. Is that, am I even too old now? Too old? Okay. Um, we're going to be in Galatians 2. Um, if you want to turn there to 11 through 21. Um, 
I, I love that song we were singing earlier today, uh, Build My Life. It says we are going to build our lives on the word of God. We build our lives on this word. And it is a firm foundation that we can follow throughout our lives is this word. No matter what kind of philosophies or different theologies come against us when we're in college or high school or later in life, like we judge everything by this book, by this word. Amen? And it's not just we gather here together. It's not just the intellectual, like I want to be able to, to teach uh, this morning. I want to be able to teach and, and, and gain knowledge from what we are going through the scriptures today. But ultimately, it's not just about gaining knowledge, right? It's not, we're not in a history class this morning because this is not a dead book. This is a living book, right? So every time we open this book, it's a living, breathing word of God that, that has the ability to absolutely change our lives. So I hope this morning that we're coming in here with expectation that this book is, is, is a powerful book that can change our direction of our lives no matter what time it is. Amen? So Lord, I just pray as we start today that you will open up our hearts. If anybody, if any one of us has come in this morning with closed hearts, if anybody has come this morning with distractions or we're kind of anti-church or, 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 or we've gotten hurt by somebody this week, God, or we're tired or we got a lot going on, I just pray you will clear that all off of our plates this morning, off of our minds so that we can be truly impacted by you, that we can magnify the name of Jesus above all else, above this church, above my name, above the worship, above anybody else, God, that you will be magnified above all else. I pray that I may decrease this morning, that you may increase, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so let's get going. Um, verse 11, Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. And the other jo Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their, in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So these are some pretty uh, harsh words by Paul, right? He, he's calling Peter, right? And Peter's not just some random dude, right? Peter is like the rock who Jesus calls. He's the rock who I'm going to build my church. This is Peter, an apostle, right? So he's basically calling Peter a, a hypocrite. And you're involved in hypocrisy. You're leading people astray. So, so why is he doing that? And so I think to help us this morning, I want to bring us back to uh, a story in Acts 10. You don't have to turn there because we don't have time to re read the whole story. But I want to summarize to you um, the story, this story, so we can get better gain and understanding of what Peter, Paul is talking to Peter about today. So in Acts 10, there's this Italian centurion named Cornelius. It's scripture says he was a God-fearing man. And, and one day, Cornelius receives a vision from God. He receives a vision from God, and he says, he, he says go send your men to Peter and, and, and tell him to come back because Peter has a message that he needs to, to share with you, all right? So, so, so Cornelius, being a God-fearing man, he says, okay, he sends his men all the way to, to, Peter's, to Peter's house. In the meantime, the next day, Peter is at his home, he's hungry, right? He goes up on top of the roof to pray. He's hungry, he's praying, and all of a sudden he falls into this trance. The, the scriptures say he falls into a trance, he starts to receive this vision. And the vision is, right, he's hungry, so what's the vision? It's about food. He sees these, uh, he sees these animals coming down out of heaven, wild animals, oxen, reptiles, they're coming out of heaven onto a sheet, and the voice from heaven says, get up, Peter, kill and eat, right? You're hungry. And Peter responds to this, uh, this voice from heaven. And, and Peter says, surely not, Lord. I have never eaten anything unclean or profane. Surely not, I cannot eat this, right? Because he's, he's a Jew and by custom, he's not supposed to eat anything that's unclean, right? But, but the voice calls back to Peter and he says, don't call anything that I have made, don't call anything that I have made clean, unclean. Nothing that I have made is clean. And Peter, it says in the scripture, Peter's a little bit puzzled by this. He doesn't understand what, what's happening in this vision. And all of a sudden, a knock comes on the door, 
And it's Cornelius' men at Peter's house, right? And the angel from the Lord says to Peter, I say, hey, Peter, I sent these dudes to your house. I sent these guys to your house, and I want you to go with them. I have sent them, all right? Because you have a message to share them, the gospel to the Gentiles. So Peter takes the journey with these three men. He brings six men along with him, and he goes to Cornelius' house, and he preaches the gospel to Cornelius' house and, and basically to the, to the dirty, unclean Gentiles, right? And while he is preaching the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, it says, the scripture says, the Holy Spirit falls on the house and baptizes these Gentiles with the Holy Spirit. And Paul's thinking to himself, wait, wait a minute, they're not circumcised. But it's like, if, how can I withhold water baptism from them if, the whole, if God has not shown preferential treatment towards them, if God can baptize them with the Holy Spirit, then how, how am I going to ever show preferential treatment towards them and I won't baptize them with water? Paul starts to understand the vision. Nothing that I have created is unclean, right? So Paul then baptizes them with water. So he has this vision of, he has this vision of animals. Cornelius has this vision, sends them to the men. He preaches the gospel to them. The Holy Spirit baptizes them all. Then he baptizes them with water. Then he then shares this vision with the rest of the church in Antioch and the Jewish Christians. And he says, listen, this is the revelation that God has shown me that there, now in Christ there is no Jew nor Gentile nor Greek nor male nor female. We are all one at the foot of the cross. There's no need to be circumcised or follow the certain law. Or as Aaron likes to say, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And so he has this revelation, right? So if we put that into context, what ends up happening is Peter has been, uh, had the revelation of the true gospel. He understands it. He said all these things to verify it. And all of a sudden, these, three, these men from James come and they start to, they start to poke away at the gospel. They start to poke away, say, well, Peter, I don't know if you really saw that, right? I don't know if that's really the case. And, and it impacted Peter so much so that he stops eating with the Gentiles. And so why is Paul say, Peter, he's walking hypocrisy? Because obviously Peter knew the truth. Obviously Peter knew the truth. And so Paul is telling Peter, hey, Peter, wake up. You're not walking in line with the gospel. Um, I, this reminded me, walking in line with the gospel, it reminded me of this, uh, when I was a training coach, I worked for Greensboro Police, uh, and, and I was a training coach for new officers um, for a couple years. And I remember one of the things that you have to do with police, probably my least favorite thing to do is deal with intoxicated people or drunk people. Hate it. It's just not a fun thing to be around. And a lot of time we have these things called drunk drivers. And, and you've probably seen it on TV, right? You've seen that, that police officers have to go put these drunk, pe drunk drivers through these certain amount of tests. And I had this trainee named Brooke. And so basically I said, okay, it, it's up to, it, and what you have to do before these tests is you have to demonstrate it for them. So you'll put your left foot, your right foot, and you have to demonstrate it for them. So after you demonstrate it for them, they have no excuses that they know what they're doing. And then there's certain cues that you look for if they're falling off the line, not taking blah, 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 and it all comes into a formula and blah, 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 blah. I don't have to bore you with those details. But the thing about this test was it never really got off the ground because when my trainee was demonstrating the test, she falls over and falls off the line. And the intoxicated subjects looks, looks at her and looks at me and says, well, if she can't do it sober, how am I supposed to do it drunk? <laughs> and I said, gotcha, you admitted you're drunk. No, I didn't say that. I was like, you're right. <laughs> I looked at her, I was like, this whole case is blown. You can't even walk this line yourself. She's like, oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, so we wiped them off and said, hey, find a ride. Have a good day. But the point of the story is it's, it's if you're not focused on the line, Right? If you're not focused on the true gospel, it's so easy to drift, even if you're the one demonstrating the test. So it's like, Peter, how, how can you, know, walking with Jesus and knowing all this stuff, how can, you, how, can you, how can you go back into walking away from salvation by faith alone in Christ alone? Like, you know this stuff, man. And before we start throwing stones at Peter, 
I, I think we need to look at ourselves and is, is how easy for, is it is for us to drift from the gospel. Martin Luther said, religion had a good quote. He said, religion is the basic default mode of the human heart, right? It, it, it's... It's easy for us to say, well, if I do this, 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 and this, and this, then I'm, then I'm saved. Then my salvation is secure. Or, or I'm a good person. Well, if I come to church enough, if I come to church this day, this day, this day, plus Easter, plus this, then I'm good enough for Jesus, right? We, we turn our faith back into works. Instead of giving our whole life and trusting in the mercy of Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection of the cross, on the cross. It's so easy for us in our church, in the Western church, we, we, make, we can make the gospel about coming to church, right? We can make the gospel about church culture, that you've got to follow these certain cultural Western American rules of church in order to be saved. We can make the gospel about a certain political party. And ultimately, we can make the gospel about us. We can make the gospel all about us, which is a form of humanism. I had this lady at work uh, that I work with, and we were having a discussion. She was asking me, you know, uh, you know, how did I meet my wife and all these things, asking about my life. And so I share with her, you know, I'm, I'm from Hawaii. She's from North Carolina. How'd you get here? Well, we actually were missionaries in Australia. She's like, what? And so it's, it's a weird conversation. You know, it, not a lot of people have this kind of story. I'm from Hawaii. She's from North Carolina. We meet in Australia. Somehow we're, we're living back in North Carolina. And uh, I was like, yeah, we did mission work and um, part of the church and love Jesus. And, and, she, and she looks at me and she says, well, are you still, you still doing that church thing? I was like, I mean, I, yeah, is that even a question? I was like, is that a, I was like, yes, yeah, still love Jesus, still go to church. My wife's a mission director at, at our church. And yeah, I still love Jesus and love the church. I was like, well, how about you? Because obviously that was a leading question, right? You still love, uh, she's like, well, and I knew her family, I, I thought they were a church-going family, or they were going to church. And uh, she goes, well, um, she said, well, I'm just taking a break from organized religion. I just, at the moment, I just, I'm just not a big fan of organized religion. I'm still cool with Jesus, but I'm just not a fan of organized religion. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was like, okay. Obviously, what this means to me, what I was gaining from this conversation with my friend at work is that there was something that happened in her church, in her Christian experience that got her hurt, right? Christians, how many know Christians can be hurtful people? Raise your hand. Y'all can give me some feedback here, people. We ain't no Baptist church now. This is community Bible church. All right. Um, where was I? Oh. She got hurt in church. Obviously, she got hurt, and that happens to all of us sometimes. We, we can get hurt in church. We can feel neglected or, or things. We have maybe view Christianity as just this church culture. We get sucked up in this church culture, and, 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 and then we get hurt. And what ends up happening is, instead of saying, and, and what ends up happening is, you blame for what happens to you from church people or, 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 or people that are supposed to be following Jesus, we then blame Jesus. It's like one and the same. It's like, no, 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 Jesus is perfect. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He loves you. He died for you. Like, just because you have some people, and, and what they ended up doing is they throw everything out of the water. They neglect the faith all together. We drift from the true gospel, and we start focusing more on the culture of church than on the beauty of Jesus. When you focus on works, you lose Jesus. When you focus on Jesus, you get wonderful works. So Paul here is reminding the Galatians to not drift, right? Peter, the, the head of the faith, he's drifted off the faith. So it's easy to drift from the true gospel. There's nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. It's all in Christ's, uh, it's all in Christ's substitutionary atonement on the cross that pays for your sin. It's not works plus Jesus equals everything. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And Paul moves on here in, in verse 15. He continues his argument. He says, we who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by 
observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So to summarize what Paul is saying here, he's saying, Peter, or to the Galatians, listen, we don't believe that our works, we as Jewish believers don't believe that our works, that our circumcision or, or following our works justify us. So why are we putting the burden on the Gentiles to do it? Why are we making the Gentiles get circumcised? Why are we making the Gentiles follow the Jewish law if we don't even believe that that justifies us in salvation? We're putting an unnecessary burden on them, which is, of, which is ultimately pushing them away from the gospel. We can so many times in the church put unnecessary burdens on people looking to come to the faith. The first step is that Jesus died for you. We can't do anything to get ourselves to heaven, to heaven, to live a resurrected life. But because of Christ's death on the cross, that is what makes us saved and justified. And so if any of you have, put, have gotten put unnecessary burdens on you by the church, I, I just want to say if, well, two things. Is there is nothing that you can do right now to make God love you any more than he already does. And there is nothing that you have done in your life that makes you unworthy for the love of Jesus. His blood justifies you. I mean, and this is why Paul, I mean, those who have been forgiven much, right? Paul was literally stoning Christians. He comes from being stoning Christians, and Christ can forgive him. Christ can forgive the worst of us for the worst sin. There's nothing that separates us. That is nothing that is more powerful than the blood of Jesus on the cross, and that's what we have to understand. Verse 17 and 18, then he, he goes on in his argument. He says, if while we were seeking to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that I rebuild what I destroyed? Or does that, mean I, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I'm a lawbreaker. So then he's answering another argument here, right? He's like, the Judaizers are these people that come from James are saying, hey, listen, Paul, if you don't have to do anything to be saved, it's all what Jesus did on the cross, then why don't you just go on and live your life to what, do whatever you want to do? Why don't you just keep go on sinning? It doesn't matter, right? You're already justified by Christ. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter about any of your works, right? And I can imagine this is probably so frustrating for Paul <laughs> because I, I believe he, he answers this question because it, it's like the Judaizers are almost like calling Paul soft, right? Oh, this is a, you don't have to do anything. You're a soft Christian. And Paul's saying, you don't understand. The, guys, the gospel is not some transactional get out of jail free card where you say a prayer and you get into heaven and then you live like hell. It's not about grace versus works. It's not about circumcision versus un the uncircumcised. It's not about Gentile versus Jew. It's about becoming an entirely new person when you follow Christ. So how does he explain it? He explains that with a very powerful verse in the, in the next verse in verse 20. He, Paul says, following Jesus means... I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live in this body, that I live in this body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, all right? So it's not about hey, do I do this or this or this? Paul is saying, when you follow Jesus, the first thing you, the first step into following Jesus, what it means to be justified is that you die, is that you are crucified. Your flesh, your, your body is crucified with Christ. That's a hard thing to preach. That's why we don't hear it preached a lot in, in the Western church. Believing that we are justified by faith alone and Christ alone does not give us liberty to sin. It makes us live a crucified life. And it's interesting, we, we don't barely talk about this in church a lot, but it's, it's, it's one of the key themes throughout the New Testament in all of Paul's letters, and I'll give you a brief little rundown, an example of this. It's all through it. Galatians 5.24 says, Now those who belong to Christ, what happens? 
You have crucified its flesh with its natural desires. Crucified. Ephesians 4 it talks about laying aside your old self, which is being corrupted, so that you may be renewed in the spirit. Romans 6, 6 says, our old self was what? Crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves of sin. Romans 6, 11 says, consider yourself dead to sin, but alive in Jesus Christ. You say, well, Dave, that's only, that's only Paul, right? He's only one character in the, in, in the New Testament. Well, Jesus said, whoever would come after me must say a prayer and go to church every Sunday. Did, oh, that's not, he says, whoever would come after me must what? Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship, says, well, it's a very famous quote that says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. So Paul is answering these, these Judaizers, these, these, these people that came from James saying, oh, you think that the Christian life, that justification is just, you can just go on sinning? He said, no, justification, it means in view of God's mercy, I'm offering my life a living sacrifice to God and I'm crucifying myself and I'm no longer living for myself. I am living for him because he gave him who loved me and gave himself for me. That's good news, right? So what does this mean? It means that God is saying to David, and I'm David, he's saying, David, you left, you left alone, like me, me left alone to my flesh and my old self can only hurt people, wound people, get offended, bring disunity, greed, and corruption. That's my flesh. That's the old self. But David, I love you so much. And ultimately, that will leave me miserable. Because the more we look at ourselves and try to find answers in ourselves, the more miserable we get. But the more we look to Jesus and the beauty of Jesus, the better our life gets. So he says, David, your old self must die so that I can resurrect you. I can make you a new creation, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has gone, the new, so he's a new creation. I need to, I, you must die so I can resurrect you, make you a new creation, and I have my spirit come in you and empower you so that you can love people, you can heal people, you can bring unity to people, you can bring, be generous with your finances and your time and your money, you can bring freedom to people who are held in captive by addictions and slavery, and you can bring freedom to the broken. Old self kills, new self brings life, right? That's why Christ said, you got to die. You can't live this life alone. You can't live, you can't have do this Christian life trying to make it on your own. You have to crucify yourself and have Christ come in you. It's not this, I'm going to take one step in and I'm going to have one step out the game. Christ says, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Like, like one of my favorite comedians is this guy named Brian Regan. He's a funny guy. And uh, how many of you guys have ever heard Brian Regan? He's funny. He's good. Good comedian. But he has this bit, and I'm not going to do the bit because I'm not as funny as him, but he talks about this me monster, right? Is that some people just love to talk about me. Some talk about themselves. It's like me, me, me this, me, me, me that. And... and and the, the crucified life is saying, it is nothing about me, but it's all about you. Like how many of us came into church today, right? And including myself when I come into church on Sunday. How many of us come into church today thinking about ourselves and our wants and our needs, right? I'm going to offend some people here. You ready? <laughs> how many people come in this to say, well, I, Haley better sing one hymn today. If Haley don't sing a hymn today, I, I, I'm not going to be able to engage in worship today. Or, or, or Haley better not sing any of those old hymns today. She better only sing these new stuff. Because that's the only way I can engage in worship if I have this. She bet my word, the worship better be good for me, 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 right? I better come in. Aaron better have a good sermon today. 
he, he better not speak too much on this or he better not speak at all on this because I better be fed by Aaron and his message better be good enough or I'm gone because it's about coming to, I need to be filled up today, right? Or, or I, I want to have my seat and if somebody takes my seat, I mean, I feel that. I have the same seat I sit in every time. I, I don't care really, but it throws me off a little bit. I'm like, where am I going to sit? I don't know. It's probably one of the most frustrating things. I've seen people in here. Somebody takes your seat, it's like the demons start manifesting. <laughs> it's like, who cares? It's a seat. And you know, we, we, it's me. We come to the church, me, 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 me. What if, what if all of us who are new creations in Christ, right, we have giftings that are given by God to us for the edification and the buildup of the church, what if instead of thinking about me, 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 we come into church and start thinking about using our gifts to bless other people? How powerful do you think that would be? What if the people with the gift of encouragement will come in? I'm finding somebody you encourage today. I, I don't care if, if, if I don't get the right songs or the message is boring. I, I don't, I, what, if I, what if I have the gift of prophecy? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for someone today and prophesy over their life. What if I have the gift of teaching? I'm going to teach somebody something. What if I have the gift of serving? I'm going to serve somebody today. What if we all came in here, stop thinking about ourselves and start living the new creation life and coming in here and saying, who can we bless when we come in here? How much more powerful do you think it would be and life-changing would be when we come into this service every Sunday? And that's the difference between living a, cruci living a life in your flesh, flesh coming in here or living a crucified life when you come in here. When you go to work every single day, are you living a crucified life? Are you saying, I'm dead to my ambitions, of, to the worldly ambitions, but I'm coming here, and if God blesses me with, with a raise, praise the Lord. If, but my job is to work to the glory of God as not my job, but I'm here to bless somebody with the gifting that God has given me. I have the gospel within me when I go to work. It doesn't matter if I don't get the right promotion of this job. I'm going to love people where I'm at. I'm going to bless people as I'm out there. I'm going to live a crucified life. I think George Mueller, he's a, a famous missionary in the past. He, he has a quote that, that I really was about the crucified life. He says, there was a day when I died, utterly died. I died to George Mueller, his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will. I died to the world. I died to its approval. I died to its censure. I died to the approval of even my brother and brothers and friends. And since then, I've only studied to be approved by God. So what is he saying? He, he dies. You die to, your, to the approval of man. You die to your own opinions of how you think things should be done. You, you die to your own tastes and your own will of what your life should be. Ultimately, living a new life is you are not living anymore to make your name known. You're living crucified. You're living to make Christ made known among the earth. That's the difference between the old life, the old self, and the new creation. Everything is about Jesus and the beauty of Jesus. So how do we do this? We're no longer living. How do we no longer live for ourselves but strive to make Christ's name known and not us? Well, I'm just going to throw some scriptures at you guys because I think there's power in the word of God. Uh, Colossians 3.1 says, since you have been raised with Christ, what happens? All right, so he's talking about being raised with Christ. What happens? Set your hearts on the things that are above and set your minds on the things that are above and not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. So as we come in here, as we go out into our communities, as we go to school, setting our minds on things above, setting our mind on Jesus, I'm going to focus on Jesus and, his, and the, the beauty of who he is. This is not just some religion that, that we come to church. It's we are falling in love with our creator of the universe who died and gave everything for us even though we didn't deserve it. That's the gospel. Setting your minds on things above and our focus is on Christ. And what happens is when we set our focus on Christ, all the things of the world become strangely dim, like the hymn says. Or in Philippians 3.8, it says, what is more, Paul's talking, he says, now that I got the gospel, now that I understand, is, is how I see the beauty of Jesus, is I consider everything a loss, everything. 
He doesn't say, I consider some things a loss or I'm going to do this. He says, I consider everything in my life a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. There is nothing worth anything else in this life that I want more than to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus more than anything. And then he says, I consider everything else rubbish that I may gain Christ. And be found in him. Whatever we have to give up that is keeping us and hindering us from getting all of Christ and being all in with Christ, that is where you get the power of the resurrection. Because the verse goes on at the end of the verse says, I want, Paul says, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. So how do you know the power of a resurrection? You can't be resurrected unless what? You die. If you don't die, you can't be resurrected in the power of Jesus. You're not going to know the power of the resurrection by setting a record in church attendance or, or Bible study or doing countless amounts of good works that we think that we should do. We will only know the resurrection power if we die and let Christ live in us. As a church, the, 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 the truth of the matter is that the enemy does not care if we build a church without Jesus. We can build a church with programs. We can be a, build a church with a big screen. We can build a church with the best instruments and a good preacher. And it, but it doesn't matter. The devil could, the enemy could care less about that kind of church because they're not making an impact. The enemy is nervous about a church who, who considers every, who everybody in there considers everything rubbish, but they're in love with Jesus Christ. And they believe their salvation, that everything about, everything, their salvation, their whole life is consumed with gaining Christ. It's not the name of Community Bible Church that people get freed. It's not the name of David Lehman get that people get freed or Aaron Martin. It is in the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus of the, on the cross that you only can get freedom. This is why we want to be a church about Jesus, because everything else is garbage, but that when we come together and magnify Jesus. So why was this, as we finish, why was this so important to Paul? Why is this all throughout the epistles? Because what, one of the reasons I believe, he's like, what, he, you know, he's telling, he's telling Peter, Peter, like this wasn't just an unnecessary part of the gospel, right? He said, Peter, this is important stuff. This is important stuff right here. Because if we don't live the crucified life, then our message is going to be ineffective, right? The world would hear the message. As the early church is growing, the world would hear the message of the gospel. But if the message of the gospel didn't make the disciples look anything different from the world around them, then why would they believe the message at all? See, the question is, if the church looks the same as the world, then why are they going to believe that the gospel is true? And this is what made the early church so powerful. It's because every single one of them was proclaiming the gospel everywhere they went. But when they looked at the early communities, they were transformed. Let me give you one example of one quote by an apologist named Justin Martyr of the early church. He talks about the Christian communities. He says, here were societies where rich and poor, slaves and free, Gentiles and Jew came together without distinction. We who used to value the acquisition of wealth and possessions more than anything else now bring everything we have into a common fund and share with those in need. We used to hate one another and destroy one another and refuse to associate people with another race and class or from another country. Now because of Christ, we live together with such people and pray for our enemies. So these, these, these people saw, like, man, there's this, there's this like, message that this, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then they would look and be like, man, there's something different about it. Look, there's Jews and Gentiles eating at the same table. That there's rich and poor, there's slave and free. They're all coming together in unity, in love. And it said about the early church, there was a quality of love that was unique when they came together. See, what happens is when we live the crucified life, we truly become what I think Jesus calls the salt of the earth, all right? What's the salt of the earth and the light of the world? It's the saviors of society, right? 
But the interesting thing that happens in Matthew 5 when it talks about the salt of the earth, it says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything so to be thrown out and trampled under your foot. So we as a church can be the salt of the earth and light of the world, but if we lose the focus of Jesus and we start to just play church in the programs, what happens is we lose the resurrection power and we're therefore no look good for anything so to be trampled underfoot. That's why you see, how many churches do you see on every block but there's still how many people not following Jesus have been saved? Because not every church is living with the resurrection power of Jesus. We're playing, a lot of times we play church and not live that crucified life. So, it's kind of like, oh, is that heavy? No, it's not heavy because it, the most amazing freedom you can get is when I say, God, I can't do this. I am a wretched sinner. <laughs> I'm not good enough. I'm not a good enough worker. I'm not a good enough husband. I need you to take over all of me, and I need to die. To my old self, please make me, empower me with your spirit, and make me a new creation. That brings freedom. Therefore, if people don't think I'm good at something, I'm, I, I go to training sometimes at work and I get nervous. Well, I, I want to be good at training because I don't want people to think I'm this or that. I want people to think I'm good at something. And, and I've started, to, before I go, I'm like, I don't care. I mean, God accepts me. I'm good. Therefore, I don't have to come with this like, oh, if somebody teases me or if somebody makes fun of me or, or I'm going to, I get offended, then I'm going to, I'm going to fight back. It's like, that's cool. I'm dead. <laughs> You can't hurt somebody that's already dead, right? If you're dead, you can't, be, you can't have your pride. There's no pride in death, right? You're dead. So the last thing I'll leave us with today is one final scripture because I love scripture. And uh, it's Hebrews 12. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. So what I believe as I was praying and I was meeting with some people about this scripture, um, what, what I'm just going to pray and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to show us, what in your life is entangling you? What is hindering you? If there's anything... What is hindering you from, from stepping all the way into that baptismal pool? <laughs> what, is, what is hindering you from going all the way under in a death in life? Is there any sin in your life that is entangling you and keeping you from the resurrection power of Jesus? Are you holding on to a relationship that you know is not right? Are you holding on to the love of money? Well, I want to follow Jesus, but, but I got this goal and I need to spend my time building my 401k up and not so much gaining Christ. Like what is it? What is the idol in our lives? I have idols. What is the idol in our lives? Because the writer of Hebrews says, since we are surrounded because such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run our race with perseverance. So how do you do that? How do you run this race with perseverance? How do, you, how do you finish this race while staying on this line? It says that you fix your eyes on Jesus. There's nothing greater than Jesus. And if I could just, anything to you today, that this, this faith, you can go ahead and clap. You can do whatever you want. We can be free in this place today. You, you can... The true treasure is in Jesus Christ, not in coming here. There's not power in coming in this room. There's not power in anything. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Throw off everything that hinders you. Fix your eyes off Jesus. And the last thing is find yourself a Paul. Because all of us will, even myself, I'll, I'll find myself walking this line and because of situations and circumstances that happen in my life, I'll find myself questioning things. But if you don't surround yourself with people who love you enough to tell you the truth, to push you back towards the gospel, 
then you're going to end, you, you have a propensity to end up like this. I have people that I was in missions with in Australia where I used to live, and I know they had an experience with Jesus. They believed the gospel. There was no way I would ever think they would fall away from the gospel. They've seen, they saw miracles, all kind of crazy things. They believed the gospel. They had good theology. And I, and I you know, lose touch with them after a while. And the horrible thing about social media to me sometimes is that you can see these people. Like I see some of my old friends that used to follow. And I'm like, they've gone way off. They've rejected the faith. And I'm like, how do you go from here to here? Surround yourself around people who are not going to say, oh, just do what's good for you. Just look inside yourself and become a better you. No, you need to be around people that say, okay, you're, you're struggling with your, I, I see, what, I know what you're going through, but what you need to do right now is you need to fix your eyes on Jesus because you're walking out of the line with the gospel. Find yourself a Paul. Find yourself, and it's life or death, find yourself somebody that can pour into your life that you know will tell you the truth. Amen? That's it. <laughs> Jesus, I pray. I pray that anything that you did not want to put into people's minds today, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will just help there not to be any confusion. Help there not to be any confusion. Help there be just, just the pure presence of the Almighty God in this place today, God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that... <laughs> It's so easy to fall back into religion. It's so easy to fall back into works. It's so easy, God. But I just pray that, that <laughs> I pray that everyone in here, including myself, will always recognize the beauty of you. And we can, we can make our lives not about ourselves, but we can magnify and glorify you above all else in this life, God. You just claim today there is nothing greater than you. There is only power in the name of Jesus and not anything that we can do. Bless us today and help us to be able to celebrate right now as we transition to seeing people doing this exact thing, God, being buried to, <laughs> buried in baptism and death with Christ and being resurrected to new life. God, what a great application to watch these young men and women get baptized today. I pray, Lord, that you will do something spiritual in this place today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So right now, we're going to transition. We have a few people getting baptized today. And it's a celebration. It's the best thing that could ever happen in the life of the church, is seeing somebody say, I have given my life to Jesus, and I'm burying myself in death and raising to new life in Christ. And we have Selena here this morning. I don't want you to get in the water too quickly. It might be real cold. we got our, 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 our kids coming in because why? This is a celebration, right? This is, this is someone who is saying, I want my old self to die, and I want to become a new creation. And baptism, I don't believe, is just a public profession of a private faith. Like, I believe as Selena goes under this water, and she comes out of this water, there is something spiritually that happens in her. There is a power of the Spirit of God that comes in her. And so we're gonna, Selena, I'm gonna have you step in this cold water. All right, you can sit down. Hi guys, my name is Selena Hop, and I'm 10 years old, and the way I became a Christian is I heard this song and church and I could hear God just telling like telling me to come to him and saying Selena it's time like come to me and so I just wanted to start following him. I need Jesus as a savior because I'm broken and I'm sinful and if I didn't have Jesus as a savior I would just be going to hell. I want to be baptized because I want to just be with Jesus and follow him wherever he leads me to. Amen. So, Selena, you okay? <laughs> this is an amazing moment. It's my honor to baptize you today. 
So Selena, I just have a question to ask you. What is your confession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Amen. So Selena, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're buried to life in baptism and raised to new life. Hi, I'm Sonia Piambino, and I'm a sophomore at HPU. So growing up, I believed in God, but I did not truly know what that meant or what that looked like for me. Uh, and in high school, I was definitely living for the world and chasing after my own aspirations and dreams and desires. And um, in March of 2022, I was faced with a um, near-death experience with blood clots in my lungs. And in that moment, I had to, I chose to look to God and um, saw after his glory and his goodness because I no longer could run after my own. And I gave my life to Christ in a church near my home and truly did not know what walking in obedience meant, but I knew that I believed in God and I believed that he was real and that he was the author of my story. And coming to High Point, I was immediately um, found some really great friends who showed me what being an obedient Christian looked like and what having a true relationship with God meant. And over the course of the fall, I found CBC. I got a text from a random girl named Ava Taylor in December. And after that, um, she discipled me and really showed me what it was like to not only be um, a vessel for God to use, but a, a vessel for God to help others and to show others um, Christ's glory. So the gospel is the story of Jesus Christ dying on the cross to, for our salvation and to save us from our own sins. I'm looking to be baptized because my old self has passed away and the new is here and I would like to outwardly proclaim, proclaim my faith um, as Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Sonia, when I look at the way that you live out your walk for Christ, it reminds me of two pieces of scripture. And the first is Psalm 33, 21, because your heart is glad in the Lord. And the second is Romans 1, 16, because you are not ashamed of the gospel. And Sonia, it's been so awesome getting to disciple you. It's been one of the most fulfilling joys of my life. Um, just seeing you grow and learning from you as you grow has been so sweet. And I'm just so excited to watch you to continue to make his name known. So with that, Sonia, what is your profession of faith? Jesus Christ is Lord. <laughs> I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in the newness of life. Um, my name is Paula Rivera, and I am 13 years old. And I have been a Christian since I have five years old. My aunt um, prayed for me to accept Jesus in my in my heart, and she explained to me the gospel that Jesus came um, from heaven and died for me and for my sins. I want to be baptized because of all the wonders that Jesus has done in my life. Um, to be buried with Christ and come, al come up alive in Him. Well, Paula, it has been a pleasure to see you in student ministry, growing and learning with our students and I love your humor. Uh, you have messed with me a lot, made me laugh a lot. It's been a joy to be a pastor and be around you. So uh, I just have one question. What is your confession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Well, with that, um, I bury, or <laughs> baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in death and risen to newness of life.
When I was a kid, I've always been in church, and I was saved when I was an early teenager. And me and my wife's been in church here and there through the years we've been together. And probably over the past year, I've got to reading the Bible and doing Bible studies and coming to church and just feel like I want to walk with Jesus. The gospel to me is learning about Jesus and what he's done for us and that we can be forgiven for our sins. I want to be baptized to show my commitment to walk with Jesus and just live through Christ. Anthony, it's my pleasure and joy to baptize you today. What is your confession of faith? Jesus is Lord. All right. So with that, I want to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in death and risen to newness of life. Ooh. Um, so I started going to church probably when I was 15. But, so growing up, I never heard about God. Nobody went to church. Um, I went occasionally, off and on, from 15 up until I actually got saved on August 5th of last year at a little church in Thomasville. One of my friends was speaking there, and I went to watch him, and, and God just moved. And I did something I would never do, like go up to the altar and drop down on my knees, ask for forgiveness, and I got saved. And I felt like a different person ever since. After I got saved, I enrolled my son into a Christian school and I didn't want him to be learning the gospel and me be clueless. So I started attending that church. My husband watched and then he started coming to church with me and um, I wish it had happened sooner, but I'm glad it happened while my son was young and he will know Christ through me. The gospel is God sending his only son to die for our sins so that we could have grace. I want to be baptized to show the world my commitment to God and that I'm walking with Christ. Well, Heather. Heather, it's my honor and joy to baptize you today. What is your confession of faith? Jesus is Lord and my Savior. That's awesome. Well, with that, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in death and risen to newness of life.
priceless, how precious, there's power in the blood of Jesus. How priceless, how precious, there's power in the blood of Jesus. How priceless, how precious, there's power in the blood of Jesus. How priceless, how precious, there's power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. worshiping with you guys this morning. For any of our guests here, we just thank you so much for being with us this morning. I hope you were blessed, but I hope most of, most of all that you fall in love with Jesus this morning. First time, second time, whatever it may be, fall in love with Jesus this morning. You guys are powerful. We thank you guys. Go in the power of a crucified life with the Holy Spirit and the power of the resurrection. You guys have been sent. Have a good weekend.